Hello and welcome to Statistically Insignificant, a podcast with scrawl about statistics and how it screws you over in your everyday life. My name is Tess, my pronouns are she, they, and I'm getting into this Uber, ready to give the driver an unasked for special lecture about unionizing. In the driver's seat, it's Bart. Hey there, mate. Uh, have you considered organizing with your fellow drivers? Hey there. Uh, I go by him, him and... Um... Uh, is the radio fine? Like, what's the problem here? Can we just, like, shut the fuck <laughs> up and move on? Ah, see, that's going to lower the rating that I give you. And because, of course, I am, you know, going to coerce you into talking to me as a result of hanging your employment over your head, that's totally going to affect you. Oh. <laughs> Climbing into the wrong car by mistake, it's Dean. Do you, how do you know that story? Because I have gotten into the wrong Uber by mistake. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that story. <laughs> so, uh, Go well, on. hi, my pronouns are, her pronouns are he and him. Once when I was trying to get from work to uh, an event in the evening, I called an Uber and there was nowhere for them to park. So the Uber came, fucked around up and down the street and then just tried to drive away. Anyway, so I saw it stopping at the traffic lights. So I dove into Sydney traffic, <laughs> crossed the road and pulled into the car Whereupon the driver said, get the fuck out, because there's somebody else in the Uber. He <laughs> dropped my fare to pick up a different person. At which point, I saw the Uber that was for me pulling up to where I had been standing previously. I walked. I walked. <laughs> Took me an hour and 20 minutes. I fucking walked. Ah, uh, so that's why your Uber rating is like two or something. Exactly. So anyway, but I'm not getting out of this one. I'm sorry. Wherever you're going, I'm coming with you. <laughs> so as you may have guessed, today we are talking about Uber, specifically the way that prices and driver pay work as statistical systems. Pretty much everything we're going to talk about is directly relevant to other rideshare jobs, and more broadly to work which is dictated by algorithms. So we're also going to look at the ways that drivers have resisted exploitation by the algorithm, ways that they have worked around it or worked out how it functions and used that to their own advantage. And we're going to look at the sort of statistical model and data workers could use to reverse engineer Uber's, Uber, Uber's pricing policies and those sorts of things. Because Uber has now built a pricing algorithm, which we're going to talk about in some detail, and they are not being very transparent about it, which is, of course, uh, a way for them to gain more profit by squeezing more money out of customers with higher prices and more work out of drivers with lower pay. Uber, I hardly know her. I had nothing else. Get to workshop that one. No, that, that, that's 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 the whole thing. I don't think you can really workshop that any further. <laughs> I mean, to be honest, I wouldn't call my app Uber. It sounds kind of Nazi to me. <laughs> they crossed out another um, a number of other options like seek, hail, or ride. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, ah, we got to turn it down a little bit. And like, oh, how about Uber? A key theme today will be what do drivers see as information to make decisions as contractors, supposedly operating at a free market as rational actors, and what gets, for example, withheld from them for whatever reason by Uber. The pricing and pay history of Uber is somewhat convoluted because they've changed a bunch of things in small ways over time that have culminated in some big shifts. Originally, the structure was very like taxis, so you'd have your dollar rate for distance plus dollar rate for time, basically to account for the fact that if you are stuck in traffic going slow for a long time, that is going to have a different behavior over just looking at distance. Usually plus some sort of uh, booking fee. Like a flat. Yeah, a flat booking fee. Flat booking fee, yeah. Sometimes there is a flat minimum fee as well, mm -hmm. because you don't want somebody hopping in and then, th you know, 50 cents later they get out again, right? So what Uber would usually take back in the day was the booking fee plus a percentage of the rates. So the percentage rates has also changed on the time over time. Some of the people, I, I watched an awful lot of YouTube videos for this and oh my God, my brain is busted now. We're talking about how they would get 75% of their rates. So Uber took 25%. Now people are getting 70% or later on people getting 70%. So Uber was taking 30%. So they were slowly increasing what they got out of the, the, the payment that happened. I'm surprised the employees have visibility on that. How do they know that that's what's being taken from them? So uh, it was more explicit. There were receipts, like screenshot receipts, would show you what the customer paid and what you got. Right. And I think in the original agreements for the contracts, it was in explicit rate, like okay. percentage, flat. This has become less transparent over time. 
mm-hmm. which is one of the, the things of concern here. What the workers got in terms of information was the rates that they would be paid and the, the pickup location. So they could tell where they would have to go in order to pick up a person. Uh, you could also see receipts afterwards. It's not entirely clear to me how good Uber was at like documenting this stuff for people because there's a lot of third party apps that allow you to record stuff about the trips that you could do for rideshare, basically your own accounting sort of software. Uber itself will tell you what pay you're getting for a day or something like that or for a period that you've clocked in, but I don't think they make it very easy for you to extract that information straightforwardly. It's probably not very straightforward for them to extract, frankly. What do you mean? Because Uber wasn't like set up in any particular uh, intelligent fashion. I don't mean that it was as any particular pejorative. It's just data these, structures suck when they're done in a hurry. Yeah, all these tech companies did, were not expecting to blow up the way they did. I would say Uber went in with the aim of a monopoly, though. All I'll say is, hypothetically, if somewhere were to have worked for Uber and seen their data structure, hypothetically, yeah, one could tell you it was not well put together. Okay, I'll believe that. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. So I can see why Dean's on the podcast now. I never know any. <laughs> I never have worked for anyone that we talk about. What do you mean? <laughs> that was pure hypothetical. <laughs> Even now, a lot of these sort of third-party apps will help you record that information. Then what was introduced was called surge pricing. Oh, I just had a question about that, uh, about what you just said. Would they not be told the drop-off location when they were given the... Originally, no. So this is why Uber in its original form behaved a lot like a taxi, right? You pick somebody up, they say, hey, take me here, you go, okay. It's kind of luck of the draw for drivers. Right. One of the things that, like, because I've never been an Uber driver, driver i'm not entirely sure what information was available like 10 years ago or whatever yeah but there was somebody who talked about having stuff like drop-off location hidden from them if they like like refused a whole bunch of trips and in other places i have seen people talk about how if they didn't accept some number of trips out of the trips that they were offered then they had other information hidden from them, which we'll get to. So what it may be is that early on, for some people who just accepted trips, they would see where the drop-off was. But if people were particularly choosy, as in they didn't take many jobs because they saw that the drop-off was something that they thought wouldn't work for them, they had that information hidden to punish them, if you will, or in, I suppose, the language of business, incentivize them to take more jobs. Well, that's funny because this was the period where Uber was pretending that, like, the whole thing was, like, this was for, like, middle-class people who were driving around and could, like, earn a bit of extra pocket money. This was before it was, like, professionalized. Like, well, it was always professionalized. It was always heading down that road. But their entire pitch at that time was that it was, like, a lifestyle thing. Yeah. I mean, I, I had a bunch of drivers who did exactly that. They were driving expensive cars and they were just older people who were early retirees and were just kind of hanging out and nowadays it's all you know people in their 20s who have no other work yeah i imagine those bmw people are still doing it actually probably not now that they're they're built into the uber eats as well less glamorous they're not just driving people around you know chatting food delivery no does separate. not fit the bmw they're separate are they separate yeah yeah that seems very inefficient i used to work at a pizza shop where a guy I worked with delivered pizzas in a bmw and it was because he was an international student and he got a bunch of like gambling debt. His parents made him get a job. <laughs> All right. That'll do it. You can't have been that bad at gambling. You had a BMW. <laughs> <laughs> it, the BMW was a present from said parents, I think. Okay. Well, I mean, he can't have been that bad at gambling. He kept a BMW. <laughs> That's true. true. Yeah, yeah. So surge pricing acts as a multiplier on the dollar rates. I'll explain this. Don't worry. I, I understand okay. what a multiplier is. I'm, 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 that, I'm there at least. All right. You, I, I mean, I guess it shows up in games, so. It, okay. <laughs> sure. I'm feeling attacked. <laughs> Carry on. So what this basically means is that if there's a lot of people who want a ride and there's not enough drivers, Uber will jack up the pay for drivers in order to get more people. You might have your 60 cent, so this is 0.06, this is not $60 per kilometer. And in surge, that gets a two times multiplier and you wind up with a dollar twenty per kilometer. Now you said a multiplier on the pay to the driver. Yes. 
Does the driver actually get a, an increase in pay or is it they just... Yes, of... this was quite explicitly to drivers, this is how much more you will get. Okay. So when this system was in place, drivers would see the dollar rate they were being offered. Right. And then this multiplier would be like, hey, you'll get this much in comparison to your usual rate. Here's the, do you want to come drive some things? You know? Okay. Yeah, so like this this tends to show up after big concerts and things. Uh, we'll see a very interesting use of people using it to their advantage later on. Drivers do see the surge multiplier here, so they can see that an area is particularly busy, they will get told you get a this multiplier on the what you do here. <laughs> Bonus round. Bonus round, exactly, yes. Score multiplier. Now we come to the first of two kind of interlocking things, which is known as upfront pricing. So as far as I can tell, this was first trialed in like 2018, 2016 sort of time, but it has been slowly rolled out across different geographic regions. This is one of the kind of weird things about trying to look at Uber as a statistical model, is that it basically has a separate one for each area, particularly because you have like various states and countries that have introduced their own laws around minimum wages and things. Mm -hmm. And how those get calculated is often not at all transparent to drivers. That can't have changed too much since 2018, which was, if we all know, last year. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there's also a really fun disclaimer on Uber's website regarding this sort of stuff, which says, as we work to improve the marketplace, the marketplace being where people, you know, hail rides and that sort of thing, mm -hmm. we may test functionality and prices in ways not described on this site. Oh, cool. Yeah, so we can do whatever... And you can't really complain about it because it's just a trial. It's just a trial. It's, it's just, just a trial. Yeah, yeah. It's just a little test. We're just having a go. Yeah, exactly. We're checking stuff out. We're having a think. We're working stuff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This, as belied by the name, claims to be more transparent for customers and drivers. So what it does is it gives an estimate of pay and cost up front. So when you first go to say, I would like this ride, or the driver is looking at the rides that they can take, they see the estimate of the pay that they will get. The problem being that it no longer shows things like the dollar rate for distance or the dollar rate for time in the booking fee. It's just, hey driver, here is what you will get for doing this job. Okay, so should we, so the top half of this or the top two thirds of this is where things were. Yep. And now upfront up front pricing is the new, the new way, the new regime. Yeah, so this was about 2018, it started being introduced to places. Okay. Yep. It's called upfront pricing precisely because it just tells you this is what this is going to cost or this is how much you were going to make. Uh -huh. It's estimated because the drive might take slightly longer or be slightly shorter, shorter than it is and some places have like a minimum hourly rate. So uh, one of the people that I talked to about this basically has a state or city, I think it might be state, minimum hourly wage that you have to get as an Uber driver. So if over an hour you don't do enough jobs to get that wage, uh -huh. Uber has to pay you a bit more. So that calculation is not necessarily straightforward to e for Uber to do at the time of the drive. They kind of patch it in a bit later. So there are some things where that is not exact in that sort of a sense. Uh, I will say on top of that, you'd better believe that Uber is more ready to cut pay because they think something is slightly shorter than they are to increase it. Mm -hmm. So there were some like accounts in videos of somebody saying, that they had done the um, drive, they were taking somebody to an airport or something, dropped the person at, off at the terminal, but Uber registered that as being something like 300 meters shorter than they had originally like expected. So they got a dock, they, like their pay was docked. Oh. You're right. But anytime somebody changes the address that they want to go to, or it takes longer or something, it seems that Uber is very reticent to actually add that money. To the pay the driver receives. To pay the driver, yeah. Part of what has happened here is that you have had a disconnect between the driver pay and the customer price. Because I would imagine that they'd be eager to say, no, no, um, we charged you for the extra 300 meters and we will charge you for that uh, because then we get an extra 300 meters worth of rate. Ah, well, they cut the pay to the driver. It's not clear whether they cut the cost to the passenger. <laughs> ah. I would yes. say almost, mm. a, well, have you ever received like a couple of cents have back? Have you ever because... received a refund from Uber? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, well, this is one of the big things, right? Because they are now giving you this estimate of pay and cost, for one thing, the number that they give you is not stated as a combination of the rate for the distance, the rate for the time, and a booking fee. It's just a number. Yeah, yeah. So you have to work out that stuff for yourself, mm -hmm. which is really hard because, like, I don't do arithmetic in my head because I'm bad at it. I imagine you get better with it over time, right? But... 
unless you have a relatively straightforward calculation of, oh, it's expected to be 20 minutes and 10 kilometers or something, so you can do that in your head sort of thing, you have to do decimal arithmetic in a hurry because you have like 15 seconds to say, yes, I'll take this. For a lot of drivers, in their head is what they have to make as a rate per hour or foot per kilometer or mile in order to actually earn money. One of the big things that they talk about on the um, various, like, I don't know what to call them, gig economy influencers, I guess, or gig economy organizers, some of them. The better ones I would call organizers and the more doing it for their own grandiosity I would call influencers. But a lot of what they are talking about is basically know your rate, know what you have to earn for unit of time or unit of distance in order to make money. These people have to pay all of the costs of maintaining their own cars. Mm -hmm. So you have to know how much that is going to cost you because you rack up an awful lot of wear and tear on it doing this sort of thing. Very cool that I just wanted to earn some money as a middle-aged person to BMW, and now I'm here with a fucking spreadsheet. <laughs> yeah. So no joke, an awful lot of people do their own tracking, well, to, in order to work out what they're actually being paid or to ensure that they are getting what they need. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Famously, algorithms get more just the less transparent they are. That's right. I believe that's the, um, the way that works. Yeah, yeah. In the old taxi model, were they paid a wage or were they paid a percentage of the distance and fare and that kind of thing do we know oh, oh sorry sorry you mean in uber or do you mean with actual tra taxi drivers i don't know um i think there are a bunch of different models i think that there are some places where you basically pay for a taxi license so there were some places where you would pay an amount to the local city council or whatever for a license to drive a taxi. Yeah. And then everything you made would go to you because you were functionally a private contractor, but you had to pay your own maintenance and everything like that. Sure. So in, in other cities, in other uh, like countries, you will sometimes have like cab drivers are employees. So they may get paid a commission, which is the percent, like the rate for distance and for time. Uh, and the cab company might take a cut, which is why uh, you may see cab drivers not putting on fare calculators things. Yeah. I've saved a lot of money paying cabbies in cash. <laughs> okay, so as an example calculation, let's say I've been told that there is something that's going to give me $14.50. I've been told it's 11 kilometers. You do get this information unless Uber decides that you are being too choosy, in which case they will potentially hide this information and it's going to take 20 minutes. What this can I do in my head? So that's nearly $15. $15, this is a third of an hour. So I can say that's roughly uh, $45 an hour. Yeah, that's about $45 an hour. And in terms of kilometers, uh, that's going to be a bit over a dollar. A bit over a dollar. I've actually written them out, but I'm just trying to see if I could do that in 15 seconds. And the answer is fuck no, <laughs> right? Admittedly, I don't do this all the time and you do get faster at it, but expecting people to make these decisions with very little notice, with very little information, is really anxiety inducing. And a lot of the, the videos that I saw were talking about how the pressure to make a decision and to do these calculations to your head with this upfront pricing is, is it's stressful in that environment. Yeah. So the actual numbers are, so uh, $14.50 divided by 11 kilometers gives you a dollar, whoops, $1.32 per kilometer. Hang on, you can't, you already solved this and then you pretended to do it in your head. <laughs> I'm calling you out. This is an official call. I, I was not looking at the answer. But you had, okay, sure, go on. I, Okay, I did this days ago. You think I remember arithmetic I did days ago? Yeah, I don't remember arithmetic I did 20 minutes ago. I remember the arithmetic I did in high school, <laughs> but in a more of a kind of traumatic way. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I did four hours of tutorials today. There was enough arithmetic in those done by other people. That's right, you do enough maths to wash it out, whereas I, who avoids doing any mathematics at all, and yet you're like, oh yeah, I'll come on your podcast. I'm here. To, I'm here we, we are dumb guys. We <laughs> disagree. To, but... we, are, we are here to be educated because specifically we don't know what the fuck we're talking. About. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and then we've got a uh, dollar fourteen. Sorry, fourteen dollars fifty divided by a third, uh, which is a third of an hour. Twenty minutes of a third of an hour is forty three dollars and fifty six per hour. So this is pretty good for time. Uh, it may not be so great for kilometer, depending on the wear and tear in your car. People were talking about American dollars per mile, what they would need to make, because a lot of these influences are American. 
So I don't actually know what that converts to in terms of Australian dollars per kilometer. But they, um, does that twenty minutes include the time getting to the location? Location, the pickup point. They also give a time to the pickup. Because that forty three point five six gets cut down really quickly if yeah 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 you don't have an instant pickup if the travel time between fares is yeah yeah so you would potentially need to add to this five minutes or whatever to go pick them up but let's say that's the total distance and time okay. uh, the distance to the pickup I think is one of those other things that might get hidden from you if you're being too choosy right okay yeah 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 I love algorithmic workforces they're so honest. It's very much, oh, you have all the information to make an informed choice because you're an agent. Wouldn't it be better for the company if people knew how far away the pickup was because they'd want people closest to the pickup as possible from a customer po point of view? Yes and no. It depends. Yes, in the sense that it means that the customer doesn't have to wait an extra couple of minutes. No, in the sense that disciplining the driver is potentially more important. Yeah, right. A cheesy labor force here is problematic for them because what they want is the customer experience of saying get me an uber seconds later it says one is on the way yeah it doesn't necessarily matter how long it takes for one is on the way yeah precisely. They, they don't want people saying no 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 not that one that's not enough money whatever right. yeah if someone's in a place that's annoying to get to if someone's going somewhere where there's unlikely to be a return fare that's really unpopular even regular cabbies hate that because it's hard to go back, yeah. Yeah, and it means they lose. Dead, I think was it dead hours or something? Yeah, dead miles. Dead yes. miles. Yeah. So you just if you get taken to the middle of bumfuck nowhere, it might be a great fare, but you got to imagine that's cut in you're, half. You're, you're at least back. halving, yeah, basically yeah. what you get. And this is one of the things that they were talking about: is if because you are being punished for rejecting rides, they hide the destination from you, which is done. People were talking about that being done, and I'm, you know, I'm willing to believe that it happens. Yeah. That is particularly punishing for drivers because then you don't know if your fare that's 20 bucks or something is around a city because it's like um, busy or whatever or out to the middle of nowhere, in which case you're stuffed. The lack of transparency to the driver used as a punitive measure is really, really bad. Well, also knowing that information, I know like a lot of cabbies, if it's like their last shift of the day, if it's heading towards their home, they take a fare but if it's heading in the opposite direction they won't because yes so within uber you can choose pickup or destination based filters so if it's a pickup filter it's you generally go for close to me is where i get the person if it's a destination filter you might choose close to home is where they wind up yeah so there are like decisions that uber drivers make around well it's the last one i'll pick up someone on my way home sort of yeah. thing so there are ways within the app to make that choice which is a little easier i think than it is for most cabbies because you know the pickup's usually right there unless you're, you're using like um sure. whatever oh my god i've just forgotten <laughs> what the what the 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 name is it's before text messages blackberry <laughs> <laughs> like what dog pages 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 oh my god i feel like a zoomer uber does say that it is factoring into this stuff things like supply and demand particularly at the destination so it factors into the amount it offers a driver how busy the destination is assuming that they will go on to pick up another fare uh, or that they will want to go on to pick up another fare but the reality is that the offer is not transparent it's a black box and nobody can see into it. They say, oh, this is some of the stuff that's in there, but it's proprietary and we won't tell you the whole thing and we don't have to tell you the whole thing. What customers see is the price that they are offered. What drivers see is the pay that they are offered, distance, time, potentially pick up and drop off locations, mm. right? It's hard to do in the 15 seconds as a driver, you have to calculate your actual margins for this. It's hard to do that stuff. So this is really a system that is more mentally punishing for drivers. It's potentially more information. It is more information scarce. And the disconnect, because Uber is no longer giving an explicit rate for distance, rate for time, and a pickup fee, it lets Uber reduce what it's paying drivers and increase what it's asking for customers yeah. without necessarily telling anyone. Which brings us to dynamic pricing. Okay, but dynamic is good. Dynamic means like moving. Is it? <laughs> Some things you don't necessarily want to move. No, dynamic, I believe it's like 
We are we're a dynamic company. We're a I'm sure they think dynamic that. ideals. These are good things. I believe dynamic means when people start shooting each other in a war zone. Am I? <laughs> <laughs> that's kinetic. Yes, that's, a, that's a kinetic situation. <laughs> this is a dynamic situation, <laughs> which is which means that the number of people getting shot varies from t- point in time to one. In the corporate next. speak, dynamic is always good, <laughs> yes. even when it isn't. So dynamic pricing, they don't actually say this explicitly in anything that I've seen, but this is the underlying algorithm for the price that you pay as a customer and the pay that you get as a driver. Your upfront pricing, quote unquote, is the information that you see as a customer, as a driver. The dynamic pricing is what actually decides on those numbers. So it's the underlying statistical model, whereas the upfront pricing is kind of the statistical reporting to the users. This is kind of where that disconnect between the pay and prices lies. Because while this claims to account for things like supply and demand, to rebalance pay to make it more rewarding for drivers, and still accounts for things like a base rate per distance and time, You don't see how any of that is connected. You don't get information on what other data might be in there either. Mm -hmm. Functionally, what this does is it's testing zone to see how much customers will pay for a given trip and how little drivers will accept to actually do it. That testing zone is what we're actually going to see as the dynamic part of this in the sense that now, and we have evidence of this on the next slide, we are actually observing drivers getting offered different rates for the same job yeah. in a way that there was not evidence of that happening before. It's complex, but not um, complicated, if that makes sense. I mean, if I, I work in marketing automation and everything we do there is designed around influencing behavior to slowly ratchet up towards a given goal. And if I can do it, anyone can do it. Not that I do it. I, I, I set up the system. I'm not doing the evil, but I am installing the horrible evil machine. Sure. <laughs> and I know that the horrible evil machine is not that particularly complicated because any given person, if you just get enough data about what they're going, you just say, will you pay a little more this time? Will you pay a little more this time? Yeah, yeah. And the moment they do, that that's your new That's form. the new baseline, yeah. It doesn't have to be anything more complicated than that. I'm sure they've got more sophisticated things going in. But fundamentally, when people aren't able to negotiate directly with the person who's benefiting from their produce or their labor, then the the person in the middle is able to to play them against each other. Yeah, yeah. At the moment that that ratchet turns, it's a ratchet. It's only going the one direction. Well, this makes me feel really good about like when I'm staying at my partner's place and have to be at work in Preston at six o'clock in the morning. So just have to take an Uber. I have no other like option. (laughs) Yeah, They they show you a price and say, that's how much it will cost. And you (laughs) aren't given an option to negotiate. You just say yes. But the moment you say yes, you're never fucking paying less than that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, one thing to consider, and we'll get into the sorts of things that go into this in a bit. One act of solidarity you could do is tell your driver, this is how much they charged me. Uh, drivers can't check that for themselves. I Ooh. believe I heard this on another potentially better podcast <laughs> that uh, you aren't allowed to um, be on the Uber customer app if you are an Uber driver. Yeah, so we'll talk about the forms of resistance and the forms of retaliation that Uber has done. But one of the things that they are known to do is that if you are checking what people get charged for similar trips to what you are doing by going on the customer app, that's considered fraud. Not like legal fraud, but misuse of the app by Uber and you will get banned, which is fired for a driver, right? Yeah. The, their, their argument is that because the requests for trips go into their dynamic pricing model, by checking the value, you're influencing the data. Yeah, because the moment you request a price, they get a data point that someone's interested and then that somebody has turned it down. So yeah. they're not wrong, it's just... They're evil. Yeah. (laughs) If they were being less evil, then it wouldn't be a problem. Towards the end of the show, we're going to talk talk a bit more about what this algorithm might actually incorporate and how you can reverse engineer it potentially with access to enough data. But I want to talk about the evidence of different pay offered to different drivers. Praxis is constantly looking up an Uber trip and then turning it down. (laughs) See if you can drive the price down. Okay, but if you drive the price down, that will also drive the pay down. Yeah, yeah, that doesn't seem great for, like... (laughs) Yeah, but driving the price up isn't being passed to the drivers anyway, so... No, so you should tip your drivers in cash. In terms of the evidence that different payers offer to different drivers, I have taken some data here from a video from the Rideshare guy. Uh, It was released on this date. There will be a link in the description down below. 
I have considerably anonymized this <laughs> from the original data that was presented in that video. Uh, so what happened in this video is that some people, some fans of the channel, some people who watched the channel, two of them specifically, sent in video recordings of the job offers they got sitting on a couch together going through Uber. So we had two phones in the same location, driver A owns a Tesla, driver B rents their Prius, and oh boy, the idea of renting for rideshare is another whole nightmare, but anyway, people gotta eat. Didn't Uber uh, start a branch of uh, leasing cars for that reason? Oh yeah. Ooh, yeah. Yep. <laughs> That's a good shit. <laughs> they got you going both ways, yeah, yeah, yeah. What the video has is it has them basically in the Uber app, they get alerts for jobs that come in, it shows the price, shows the distance, the time, uh, pick up location, destination location. Oh, and the time up the top. So when you're watching this, you can tell that they are the same job, right? They come in at the same time, same pickup, same destination, but different price. And that's what I want to talk about here. This table shows pricing information. This first column is the prices offered to driver A minus a dollar. And it's minus a dollar because if you are driving an electric vehicle, you get an additional dollar on top of your pay as a reward for driving an electric vehicle. So it's it's an incentive to buy an electric car, is how they phrase it. Okay. So that's why I've got A minus one, because I have subtracted that dollar off. So we are looking at the underlying pricing, excluding the electric vehicle bonus. Mm -hmm. B is just the rate offered to B, because apparently a similar thing does not exist for hybrid cars. So they're renting a Prius, they don't get that bonus. Right. The difference in dollars is literally A minus a dollar, this first column, subtract off B. So a positive number in this dollar difference column means that the driver A got offered more than driver B. Yeah, yeah. The difference as a percentage is the percentage where driver A is greater than or less than driver B. So this 42.4% indicates that driver A is being offered 42.4% more than driver B. We've got some negative numbers which indicate that driver A is being offered less than driver B. Right. I'm interested in, there's a huge variation in the difference percentage here. Yeah, so this top one is a bit special. This top one came from um, Uber Pet, <laughs> which is apparently a special Uber thing if you want to transport a pet. You can get Uber Pet, which, I mean, the people in this video were shocked that anybody actually uses it, but, you know, apparently they do. I don't wow. know why that one was so hugely different. It's what I would call an extreme value or potentially an outlier. Um, I think the biggest difference outside of that we saw was a dollar seventy-three. Call me crazy, but if I was taking my pet somewhere, I'd prefer to take a Prius than a Tesla. <laughs> I think the same is true of any ride. To be fair. <laughs> I was gonna make a joke about Uber Pet, but there's there's none that don't impugn or uh, defame defame me. So let's just say, <laughs> uh, oh, you you can't impugn or defame yourself. That's true. It's libel. Um. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I, I thought you were going to say impugn or defame either the, the CEOs of Uber or something like that. I can't impugn or defame them any more than doing themselves. This is true. I'm just going to say that there is a joke to be made here, but I will not be Uber pet. I barely even know her pet. There we go. I've done it. <laughs> well done. You took a while on that one. Yeah. That's fine. We got that. Yeah. So we can treat this top one as a bit of an outlier. That's fine. But I wanted to show it to show that, you know, the variance is quite large. Most of these aren't nearly that magnitude. I mean, the, the closest one is this one is $1.73. Oh, this is an American dollars, I should say. Uh, I can't remember which American city it is, but it is an American city. We'll say that my lack of memory is my effort to preserve the privacy of the drivers who got banned from Uber, <laughs> by the way, after they Hell did yeah. this. Yeah, I mean, even at this level of anonymity... This is not anonymous at all. You could plug all these in and find somebody who had those level of offer yeah. prices. Yeah, absolutely. It. We'll talk a bit about, more about this later, but apparently they got banned before this video was, was recorded, or before this like right. live stream was done. So my guess would be that Uber used some sort of geofencing algorithm or geolocation algorithm and saw them refusing all of these together sitting in basically the same location yeah and not moving for a long time this is a 17 minute video but fuck it go yeah. down like legends <laughs> yeah but i mean i think it's good to have this data very well, cool that it's illegal to fire them like that <laughs> well they're not employees it's, uh, it's great that uh, we live in such a dynamic employment environment yeah yeah, yeah. The other thing I'm going to point out about this data is that these two here are the same trip. The to uh, top one was the initial offer, and then when they didn't accept that, the second one was a second offer. Oh. Uh -huh. Would you like an extra two or four cents, sir? 
Yes, but this, this is interesting because this tells you what they're doing in terms of those tweaks to see where that price point is. Yeah, yeah. So they're looking at a few cents here, a few cents there. Because, I mean, chances are they have given a fixed estimate to the customer, which they may be able to fudge a little bit, but probably not a hell of a lot. So now they are seeing how little can we increase the amount for the drivers to get them to accept. And the interesting thing here is the gap is closing. The person at the top gets offered two cents more. The person at the bottom gets offered four cents more. Right. They're raising the lower level more than they're raising the top. And this is exactly the sort of manipulation you do if you are trying to adjust your pricing algorithm to maximize your profit, right? Because mm -hmm. like two cents here and there, it doesn't seem like much on an individual trip, but you look at millions of trips a day. Yeah, how much, what's Uber's actual volume day to day, do you know? No idea. I don't know if they release that data very readily. No, they wouldn't. They'd have to release it to sharehouse shareholders or something, right? Yeah, like, but you don't, may not get access to that if you're not a shareholder. Yeah, true. I do know that they have been profitable for the first time in the, like the last year or so, <laughs> like literally ever profitable for the first quarter, and it's in no small part due to this sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, drivers are being paid less than ever. Yep. <laughs> So um, you can look at these differences and the we'll leave out the top one, right? Because that's an extreme value in a special circumstance. But the differences hover between like zero, there are a couple of zeros, to nearly $2, about a dollar, most of them are between like 20 cents to a dollar sort of thing, right? Mm -hmm. For a particular driver, well, I mean, for one, they're not expected to be able to see it because they're not expected to be sitting next to another guy on the couch. But over a day where they do like 20, 30, rides 20 30 jobs rides i don't know what the terminology is here but when they have 20 or 30 or so that's maybe 20 bucks over a week maybe that's 100 bucks that adds up real fast yeah yeah um, is the difference well i we don't know but the uber and prius distinction there would it have something to do with the fact that like you mean sorry the tesla and prius sorry tesla and prius would that be because they have that weird luxury uber thing sometimes it's cheaper than a normal ride or whatever but it's mostly like just slightly more expensive yeah so i think that's a different system so you've got uber pet you have uber x you have uber xl and i think there's something else so there's a, a couple of different kind of systems that this can come through these were both on uber x right so they're both looking at the same system uber pets xl Uber heavy petting. That's extra. <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, it was slightly cheaper to get the more luxury one than the normal one the other day, so I took one and got an, mm. got a Tesla there. Terrifying experience. Yeah, the, Real they're scary <laughs> cars because I have been in one. I think we got an Uber in Queensland on the way back from the Bunta Vista live show. Actually, yeah, yeah, between the. No, between a cafe where we hit stop because we were getting stuffed around with flights and the and the airport. They're scary because like <laughs> my voice is breaking. Great, the the control panel in the center console is a touch screen. I need real door handles. I'm sorry, it's terrifying. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> I was. I got to drive in one when they first were a real sort of novelty in Australia. It was one of the ones where the, the seats were all weird office chair things sitting in the middle of a mostly open chassis. Oh my and God. Like the windscreen <laughs> went right back. Anyway, and so we, we, we took them, work and organized something to go and see um, the, the, the database center yeah. where our particular software was housed. And so they sent out a Tesla to pick us up. So we got in one of these things and buckle in. And uh, look, the, the things do go. He got on the highway and and, uh, and just sort of let it out. Sure. But then he would just like take his hands off the wheel for 15 seconds at a time. And I'm like, this is kind of cool. And then afterwards, immediately looked it up and went, that was awful. Like, <laughs> oh, these things kill people all the time. I was like, damn, we're so close to self-driving cars. And now I just think I was so close to having myself fucking decapitated. <laughs> I will say about that thing is though, it is fucking horrifying that they fucking ask you how much conversation you want. So I, I did once see a very amusing story of somebody who, I can't remember if this was a Tesla or a cab or something, but somebody just account, uh, recounting that they had somebody driving up to pick them up for some sort of ride share or taxi or whatever. And the person drive, drove up, looked at them and switched from whatever R&B they had been on to the old folks rock. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah. To which I say, owned <laughs> classic damn you've been classic rocked <laughs> yeah 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 
So I did actually calculate some statistics on this, but I did actually include the Uber Pet, uh, which is an outlier and makes these a little bit funny. So if you include the Uber Pet, the main difference is about 88 cents. So this is uh, including Uber Pet, but it's a massive outlier, right? Nothing even close to that. If you exclude that it's closer to like uh, 40 cents, I think. Because I did it and then I forgot the number, but it was about 40 cents. Yeah. yeah. So percentage wise, uh, if you include Uber Pet, it is a 5.8% difference. If you do not include Uber Pet, it gets, it's more like, like a 1 point something, 1.5% 1 difference, roughly. These are means. If you exclude the Uber Pet, it's roughly symmetric distribution, so a mean is an okay the statistic to use. In any 40... world, it's fucked up that two drivers get off at different rates. Yes, it Absolutely. is. And because they don't aren't supposed to be able to see what each other are offered, it's effectively blind bidding to the bottom because they are incentivized to accept jobs for less. Yeah. It's even more pointed than that, though, because it's like somehow reaffirming class hierarchies within, like... Oh, yeah, yeah. There are people who have less of a choice yeah. yeah and one of the comments made by the people um doing this video is that they feel really sorry for the person who's renting a prius to do this because not only on average are they getting offered less they their take home is less because they have to pay that rental cost on top of like the the cut that uber takes and whatever else yeah so people who are renting it would not at all surprise me if they get offered less because they are more desperate I can just see over time this being a system where, I mean, as the intent is, you are just selecting for drivers willing to do less. Yeah, willing to work willing for to less. Willing to work for less, and you're happy to ban people because, you know, you're, this, this business model only exists because of a high level of labor precarity across the entire workforce. Yeah, yeah. And they're like, well, we could just be extra precarious and it's, it's even better for us. Yeah, and, and in particular, like, these initial and second offer adjustments, right? Yeah. They're not putting the person at the higher pay up as much as they put the person at the lower pay. No, precisely. They... The aim is to crush as much as you can out of them by lowering what they get. And they know that the, the economic system under which they're operating has their back on this. I know that they all do. But what do we see the um, Reserve Bank in America doing? What do we see our... Yeah, run, running up interest rates, yeah. Running up interest rates and talking about how... The labor market is quote unquote tight. Yes. Which is to oh, say, that's because unemployment is relatively low. But that, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, right? yeah. It's a euphemism to talk about the fact that the, the workers are getting uppity and they might start asking for more money. Right. Supply yeah. and demand is in the favor of the worker in this case. They know they can bet their model on generating all of this precarity centered exploitation because they know that the government will enforce precarity. Yes. This business model only functions because you have the certainty. Like you could. In a world where, quote unquote, there was uh, fairness in a capitalist system, right? <laughs> and the supply and demand of labour was able to, you know, if, if labour was freely given, right, and it was it was free to sort of fluctuate in that way, you could say that Uber is making a bet on the labour going up and down. But it's here the house always wins because they know that if labour is ever to the point where it is capable of commanding a greater share of profit because there, there is scarcity of labour, they know the government is just going to fucking kneecap a whole bunch of retire near retirees or something uh to, to push it down the one thing i was going to say about this is uh don't take this data set as gospel it's two drivers they have controlled for things like geographical location time when they're doing it these are the same trips but it's 17 rides from two drivers this is not a representative sample but it is evidence that they are getting offered different rates and it is evidence of what those might look like in terms of scale and this kind of initial and then second offer to see the sorts of tweaks that get made for how drivers might be, quote unquote, incentivized to take an offer that they had previously rejected. Yeah. Right. This was not going up by 50 cents or something, you know. If you are recording data like this for yourself, please be very careful what you publish. Screenshots can be identifiable by time, by location. Like, even if you don't show your username on your name, I reckon Uber could identify who you are from a single screenshot of a trip, particularly under this system where drivers are being offered different money. If there's two or three data points, and if, you're, if you show just, more than one trip, it's yeah, it's very yeah, easy. You can you can write that up in fifteen seconds. Yeah. So I wanted to talk a bit about what Uber has been doing to retaliate against drivers, because you know drivers aren't stupid. They've been coordinating. There have been actions, and they do stuff like compare notes effectively, mm -hmm. right? They do stuff like 
publish data from what they've seen. So a lot of people that I came across, for one thing, made their own spreadsheets to work out what their margins were and this sort of thing, but some of them also published those spreadsheets. You want to be a little bit careful around terms of service with the Uber app in terms of publishing data. So that will also apply to the latter half of this episode when we talk about what can you do with all that data. They've, they've worked out that the Workers United can in fact never be defeated. Yeah. And just worked out that stop the uniting bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. If you refuse a lot of rides, Uber will start hiding information from you. I can't remember the numbers that there were some statistics for drivers. There was like an acceptance rate and a refusal rate, and I'm not sure, or a, an acceptance rate, a cancellation rate, I think it was. So an acceptance rate is of the rides you get offered, how many of them do you accept? I don't know if that includes rides you are offered while you are currently driving, because people are offered rides while they're driving. The cancellation rate, I think, is you have accepted and then cancelled. So Uber cares about these because it wants drivers who accept a lot of rides because then they can potentially be, they're potentially less choosy about the ride, so they may accept lower rates. And they want low cancellation because if you cancel rides, they have to go and find another driver and that upsets the customer. Just as a question, if you, because there's a small cancellation rate if they've picked a driver and you've ordered an Uber, does the driver see any of that? Like their own rates? No, as in like... Oh, the customer cancellation the customer rate. customer ca cancellation rate. So from what I saw, they get a rating, like a four, uh, like a star rating for the customer. I don't know if that is purely based on the ratings from the previous drivers or if that incorporates information about the, the cancellation rate. Right. Yeah, I don't know how that's calculated. They don't see a rider cancellation. No, 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 but like if you've ordered an Uber and then cancelled it after a driver has been picked, you'll be charged like five bucks or whatever. Okay, I don't know what happens in that case. Yeah, okay, right. Yeah, sorry. I didn't see it discussed, so. As mentioned, Uber actually banned slash fired the two drivers who published this data. It was before this video came out, so I think it was a matter of that they detected what they see as collusion in other ways. They didn't actually just see the data get released, but you would still probably get punished in or cancelled, I guess would be the best term really. Uh, but you may well get um, fired by Uber for publishing this sort of data. So be very careful if you're going to, to do that sort of thing. Cancelled for truth, many such cases. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so we've also mentioned that um, Uber considers drivers looking up pricing information on passenger apps to be misuse and will um, fire people for that. I don't know if Uber would actively punish somebody for asking their riders what they paid, but it wouldn't surprise me if you have to be careful around that because your riders might get upset at the question. Yeah, sure. Yeah, because like riders give ratings to drivers and that is one of the things that probably contributes to this offering. Because if you have a lower rating, you may well get offered less for driving in this model. Uh, I can imagine knowing what they go through, giving a driver anything less than the full marks. Even though they're a cunt, <laughs> like... Yes, but you're not an American who thinks that not giving a tip is their God-given right to punish a worker. Yeah, fuck Americans. That's the official <laughs> stance of statistically insignificant. That's a fun game if you're having a chat with your Uber driver, by the way. It's just, uh, oh, what's my rating? What's yours? Yeah, well, they do see the rating of the passenger as part of whether or not they accept. Wait, I have a rating? Yes. Yes. I gotta go find this out. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm pretty sure they don't know their own rating, is what I'm saying. Is so you can. Um, yeah, yeah. I would be surprised if you didn't. Like, I feel like that would be something that you get told in order to incentivize you treating the customers in ways that up it. Like, because you, I think that you see the ratings that you've been given by previous rides. So it may, yeah, like, okay, like, I'm no. talking out my ass here because I, because I don't know, <laughs> but I would be very surprised if you don't see your rating because it is to Uber's interest to push you to push it up, yeah, right? Yeah, So because it's a cudgel that Uber could use against you, that's a reason to believe that they'll show you that data. <laughs> they can use it against you without you being able to see it. You can use it in both ways, right? You can use it in ways that are non-obvious, like offering a lower pay rate under this model. You can use it in ways that are obvious. That would have been cool. I guess it was an Uber driver. I talked to a couple of people about it um, before I did this, but I just didn't have time to coordinate a guest. Mm, fair enough. Yeah. It also seems like... You don't want to come on this podcast to, uh... No, about, like... you'd certainly be worried about <laughs> retaliation, right? I mean, this is one of those things where... Well, I don't think anyone... My annoying orange voice modulator. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Turns to make him a baby! Yeah! <laughs>
Oh, I have a note at the bottom of this uh, page, by the way, which says these people need better OPSEC, which means these people need better data privacy and data security practices. In general, looking at the forums where Uber and, and Lyft and all these other things, looking at the forums when they talk to each other, looking at the, the videos that they make and things, they are showing so much information that makes them identifiable, particularly to Uber. Mm -hmm. Some of that Uber may not see as malicious, but that's their choice. We get to talk about worker resistance because Uber drivers aren't stupid. They can see that they're getting screwed. In fact, a lot of a lot of the kind of social environment of these forums and other spaces like that is very much a case of, well, we're worried that people here might be from Uber watching us. So the hyper surveillance stuff is really, really pervasive. I just think that a lot of them don't necessarily know how to account for that in terms of what they're sharing. But solidarity is really interesting for this kind of atomized workforce. There is a bunch of research on it because uh, sociologists look at anything and go, ooh, I want to see that. Also, some of them may themselves be Uber drivers. But research does show that what one paper described as just in place supply works against solidarity by reducing worker socializing. So because Uber drivers are in their cars, because Uber drivers are expected to show up to where you are to pick you up, there's not really a cab rank, right, where you can talk to other cab drivers. So those sorts of spaces where you might form these worker solidarity things are not really present. And there's an ideological component to that as well. Drivers are encouraged to see themselves as sole operators competing with other drivers as entrepreneurs, and they're told that their success or failure is a result of how smart they are as individuals, how good they are as drivers, how they are able to game the system which other people who are less smart can't. So there is very much this, I'm successful because I'm smart, I maybe start a YouTube channel or something or a Snapchat or whatever. I don't know what the kids are on these days, right? I start some way of promoting myself as a smart person by telling other people about my strategies and that sort of thing. So these are the influencer types of drivers. They don't see themselves as workers in solidarity with other workers. And that is something that Uber wishes to instantiate, right? This is not universal, but there is a lot of that. Well, if you want to dig into it, like the... The car is a device intended and executing the decay of solidarity of over oh, yeah, a, long, a long uh, period of time. That was a very uh, intelligent contribution, but my contribution would be to say that I now want to see another transporter movie with Jason Statham, but he's an Uber driver this time. <laughs> there was an action movie in like the 2010s where it was like a bike delivery guy who gets embroiled in a scandal, but uh, not a scandal, like a some sort of plot. I can't, I didn't, don't think I actually saw Theft, the movie, but perhaps. I was fascinated. But like it was <laughs> shot like an action movie, but it was just like a bike delivery guy going around. Yeah. So his superpower was riding the bike really good. <laughs> really good. <laughs> That's incredible. Uh, Tengen Rider, yes, from One Punch Guy. <laughs> so that guy's going to make a lot of money on Uber. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Because he's really smart and capable. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. All right. Gotcha. The, the, his diff, uh, skill diff. We're talking about, <laughs> is that a gamer term you're aware of? Price diff? Oh, my God. I've played, like, diff? I've played like eight games since high school. Dan, you're going <laughs> to... These are going to be lost I'm on me. I'm not explaining the joke. <laughs> I mean, I'm explaining this joke even less than I would explain others. So what we're seeing here is that Dean has a skill issue with his comedy. Skill diff. Comedy diff. <laughs> some of these people, some of these spaces, some of these people on YouTube or whatever are very explicit that they are looking for solidarity with other workers. They talk about strategies to coordinate in these things. Others are very much there to talk about how good they are and how smart they are and how they can game the system and how stupid and incompetent other writers are who aren't able to do that. Of course, the people who are working in that framework are kind of buying into Uber's individualism, which is one of the reasons that I, I find the kind of influencer style YouTube video stuff around like the gig economy thing so obnoxious because it's very much buying into the kind of capitalist model where it's meritocratic where if you are just better at it you will succeed and be able to you know get ahead and all this sort of thing when the reality is Uber is going to screw you regardless and Uber is going to screw you as hard as it can whether or not you're a particularly good driver and their take will increase over time while they are expected to maintain profitability. Okay, 
That's one way of looking at it. But have you considered get that bag? Okay, but the bag can be bigger if there's more people. No, involved. but the bag from the YouTube revenue supplements the Uber. Oh, plan. yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> this is 100% a part of it. Like the rideshare guy, for example, has like a few hundred thousand f- subscribers or something. God, imagine. <laughs> so, so there is certainly people for whom becoming an influencer in this sort of environment is itself a hostile strategy, right? I mean, like, we're all on that shit. Like, honestly, if you if we look deep in our souls, like, we wouldn't be talking on this podcast if we weren't, like, uh, if we didn't have that part of our brain. <laughs> yeah, I mean, desperately wishing for the podcast to become, to break even, you know, like, <laughs> oh, on that note, we have a Patreon <laughs> <now>. <laughs> Some research has actually found demographic divides between those inclined to solidarity actions and those not. White guys in the Bay Area who do in fact own their Teslas and this sort of thing are potentially less inclined to act in solidarity than like people of colour and migrants who may be renting their cars and, and are driving around less salubrious areas. Th- this idea that you are a genius whose genius lets you beat the system is quite pervasive in a lot of these areas. Online social spaces and online content are a really kind of interesting space for this because you see forums, old school, you see Facebook groups and YouTube comments, they share stories and they share strategies, but that mistrust is ever pervasive because there's always the fear that in this public forum, somebody else on the forum could be an Uber rep. Or there is a lot of, like, mistrust of advice from other people if it contradicts how you think you should do things, because it may be they're not as smart as you. Nonetheless, the willingness to take screenshots and share it in public places is, uh, in, in very identifiable <laughs> ways, is very kind of unsettling. <laughs> I'm not any kind of a privacy expert, but I really do encourage people to minimize the amount of data that they share. I realize that there are, th- there's a conflict there between what's considered evidence of authenticity and privacy, right? Because if you share a screenshot of the Uber app with this identifiable information, people will accept that those are the actual numbers and that's the actual information that Uber gave you. If you list in text, here is the price I got, here is the distance, all that sort of thing, that is immediately more suspect because it's been abstracted away from the screenshot. There is a level of doubt around stuff that is not identifiable because it is considered potentially inauthentic. It's depending on the risk that people are willing to take, but they should at least be aware that they are taking the risk. I also suspect that there's organizing happening. Well, not organizing, but at least like talking about this stuff in real life spaces, at least within like uh, particular tracks of people who do this for a living, you know? Yeah, yeah. So there is potentially less than you think. Uh, in the sense that, so the surveys that I saw, the survey, I should say, that I saw that was done on Uber drivers found that they generally didn't socialize with other Uber drivers, like even if they'd been driving for years. Yeah. But there is one example that I do actually want to talk about, and I think, yeah, it's next in my notes, which is an actual example of a space that was specifically able to allow that solidarity action, that communal behavior, because it was a physical space. I went to like a curry restaurant that was up like, that was like late night on like a Sunday night kind of thing, not not the kind of thing that would be open. And I think like most of the clientele in there would be, if not Uber drivers, people working in similar kind of fields and stuff, but because it's within like a, it seemed to be like a situation where like this was the stopping point for a lot of Uber drivers and that kind of thing. Like, yes. Uh, yeah. People find spaces for solidarity. Yeah. The one I'm going to talk about was dominated by migrants and people of color and, yeah. and was perceived to be that by white Uber drivers in the area as well. I also like that place because on the soft drink freeze, it had like a handwritten note saying brothers code zero is not haram <laughs> <laughs> with apologies to bart tess and the listener my headset is dead and i am now so full of eight percent ginger beer that i have to go lie down <laughs> okay well uh that's a shame because this next bit was going to be really good for you i'm i'm really sorry i also may have to go throw up and i wasn't going to say that on the record. incredible <laughs> okay okay have fun. <laughs> look it's 6.4 standard drinks at around about like three it's eight percent and he drank a liter of it <laughs> Yeah, so the example I want to talk about comes from the paper Wells, Attar, and Cullen in 2020. There'll be a reference down below. It comes from an airport near the district DC, which I think is the District of Columbia in the US. So that airport, I don't think it's actually in that province, but whatever, it's near there, had a car park away from the main terminal 
which was specifically for share drivers, uh, ride share drivers. So what happened is that the um, taxi drivers have their cab rank out the front of the airport and they got upset quite understandably with uh, the encroaching Uber drivers basically rocking up and hanging around to pick up rides. So Uber in conjunction with like the taxi union, the airport and the local council or whatever set up this kind of designated car park where these Uber drivers and other rideshare drivers could go and wait for rides from the airport. This is a space where you can talk to your mates, Hell right? Yeah. You can talk to your fellow drivers. So of course they do. And they start comparing notes and all this sort of thing. And Uber actually set up uh, an interesting sort of an algorithmic thing, which I think is not the worst idea, which is called a geofenced queue. So basically it was Uber saying, you're in this car park area. We know you're there. You've just signed onto your app. So you're going to get offered jobs in the order that you sign on. Yeah. So the first person who shows up gets offered the job first, and then it kind of goes down the line. So this is works like a digital cab rank in that respect. And this is just a way of making it, I guess, fairer for the drivers there. For sure. Unsurprisingly, people in this environment, because surge pricing was a thing at the time, start coordinating. So what they would do is that groups of drivers would rock up there and all log out of the Uber app just as a huge plane came in. So this would be a plane with like 500 people or something or whatever, right? Yeah. Some number of which are probably going to want rides on Uber. If there are no drivers in the area, Uber will offer surge pricing in order to get more drivers. They'd all log out, they'd sit there watching watching their phones, watching the plane land, and then like 20 minutes or whatever after it landed, once the surge pricing started being offered, they would all log back in again and get double, sometimes triple the money that they would have been offered otherwise. Or I can't remember actually if it was surge pricing or just some other sort of bonus or incentive system. But basically yeah. they were getting a lot more money as a result of coordinating their efforts to make it look like there were fewer drivers than there actually were. Hell yeah. Uber, of course, treats this collaboration like fraud. And when it found out about this, banned a number of the drivers as a result. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's really interesting because they worked out what was going on, right? And because they were in a space together they were able to say, no, let's let's coordinate, let's get more money out of this. So other things that happened is that some Uber drivers have asked their passengers what they get paid, and this has led to interesting discrepancies between the number that is cited on the receipt that the Uber driver gets and the number that the actual customer was charged. Yeah. It's not clear what's going on there. The photos and the screenshots that I saw indicate a difference, like sometimes a few dollars or something like that. I don't know if that gets rectified or not, but it's certainly questionable and it's not transparent what's going on. For sure. So we've talked about what's happening. We've talked about some of the data that gets collected and that there is this algorithm running around in the background, this dynamic pricing thing, which is fiddling these numbers so in order to maximize profit. But because it is an algorithm that is data driven, it may be possible to reverse engineer at least some parts of it. I am not sure if collecting the data for this sort of thing is against the terms of service for Uber. If it is, of course, I would never encourage somebody to breach the terms of service for it. <laughs> but here's the data that you could collect. Tess, Tess is more careful than I am. <laughs> so here's the sorts of data that you could collect from a number of different people. And there are actually... Um, there are actually organizations that are like labor organizing minded that are doing things like secure data collection. So I think I've got a link to one uh, in, the, in the comments below, but basically they are sites that are coordinated by actual institutions for research. So university institutions and things like that, or by labor organizations and those sorts of things that say, hey, these are the people we are associated with. We would like your Uber data. Uh, to run research and that sort of thing. They are potentially more reliable in terms of data privacy than posting your stuff uh, on the internet for all to see. But again, I don't know if this is against terms of service stuff. So, you know, just be a little bit careful with that. So the basic idea here is that people track their own data. They have access to some amount of this anyway. We can have a think about the sort of things that Uber would put in to a pricing model. And then we can think about, well, we can st stick as much data as we can through a statistical model and see what actually shows up as affecting the outcome. Oh, the other thing is to say that even if this is not explicitly prohibited by the usage of the app, if you are found to be doing this, Uber may just find another excuse to ban you. Don't risk your job if you don't absolutely have to. So here what we're going to do is work from first principles to try and reconstruct 
the pay and price algorithm. So basically you would pick one to be the outcome. Usually I would pick like worker pay as the outcome. Uh, but you can also get price in there as well. Usually if you pick worker pay as the outcome, if you can get your hands on the price information, you put it in as an input. So what we're basically going to do here is come up with the things we think might contribute, then ask how would we collect data on that. Collecting data securely from a bunch of different drivers, you can do if you know who they are. It just means that you need to store that encrypted somewhere, preferably not really connected to the internet in order to work with it properly. I'm not a security expert, if you're a data researcher, you'll have better ideas of how to do that than most people. I feel like that's an unfair condition. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think most of the people driving Ubers are uh, data researchers, and I don't know. Well, no, but there's a surprising number of them who will still put that data out, and I'm just hoping that other people can <laughs> do better to protect them, you know? Sure. So we're going to put together a model based on what available data there is. Uh, I'm not going to see this data, so there's only so much... I can say about what I would put into a model. You really need to get in into the market and play around with it to do that. And you can see once you've built that statistical model, what shows up as actually contributing to changes in the pay. I would first of all assume that there is some baseline pay per kilometer or per minute. So this is your baseline rate for the job. Yeah. That baseline may, rate may depend on the driver. So the driver, and like how long they've been driving, what do they drive, what is their rating, all this sort of other detail around their kind of profile, if you might, is also potentially very relevant. Uber claims that it does not put personal information into this algorithm, but what they count as personal information may not include driver profile stuff like your rating, your like refusal or acceptance rate and that sort of thing. So they probably just basically mean personal information like your name, but you might, might have quote unquote de-identified information that is still actually about who you are as a person. Yeah. I reckon that there is potentially a relationship between these two. So I'm going to say these two probably interact. Oh, sorry. Under driver profile, we've got like stuff like rating, refusal, slash acceptance, slash cancellation rate. Other things like time of day. If it's very early morning, very late at night, in those sorts of situations, you may have a higher rate because it's just in an hour and there's not much around. Driver su supply slash rider demand. So the surge pricing still exists, I should have said, but a lot of people were talking that they expect that to get just folded in to the one rate you see. Sure. Yeah, in, in the near future. Which... That's, uh, <laughs> that's gonna be fucked. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's just less transparent, right? Great, yeah. just what we wanted to see. Uber on the little, like, map, of where you are, it shows regions that have high or low demand. So they have these metrics for high or low demand that you can potentially see as a driver. In this stuff, I'm thinking about the sort of thing that you as a driver might be able to identify. I'm also thinking weather. Oh, I can hear Dean vomiting in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> Classy. What I mean by that, like if it's particularly hot, if it's raining, if it's particularly cold, these things may mean that you can charge a rider a higher price. They may or may not mean that you can give, that, that you will get more money as a driver. Yeah. Put this in and see whether it makes a difference to driver pay. See if it makes a difference to rider costs. And then you can determine if Uber is using that to screw customers and not pay drivers for that difference. One interesting thing about weather is if we look at temperature, and uh, if anybody is actually doing this data analysis, presumably within the terms of service and so on and so on and so on, this is one of the considerations that goes into building the model. If we have price versus temperature, right? Hot is up here, cold is down here. If we expect both very hot and very cold environments to elicit a higher cost, you might get a relationship that looks like this. Yeah. This is not a straight line. You cannot fit a straight line to this. If you are building this model, you need to look beyond a simple linear relationship. Yeah. This may show up with a whole bunch of these different things, like time of day, very early morning, very late at night, may have a similar sort of relationship depending on how you're measuring that. Well, you know, I take a few Ubers very early morning and the cost is not that high. So I'd be very interested to hear from drivers about like what they get paid at that time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is also something that is of interest to the customers, not just because they may be interested in the driver pay, but also because 
this is Uber trying to ratchet up the price that they pay at the same time that it tries to suppress what it gives to the, the workers. Yeah, absolutely. You are paying more as a customer as a result of this. That's true. And honestly, like, I feel bad enough about, like, taking Uber as, as is. So I'm not, like, losing sw- sleep over it. Well, yeah. no, but that disconnect is, I think, of particular interest. But it also sucks to pay more because Uber has to pay its shareholders. For sure. And, and it will price this out of reach for some people who genuinely need it yeah like a lot of the areas where uber has come in and become a monopoly in a hurry and then the taxi industry has died or something like that if you are don't own a car and you have a disability that means you can't walk very well you may actually need uber when uber first came out they didn't follow like disability regulations around yeah. taxi companies and stuff. Is that still true? I... I don't know. Certainly, you see stories about Uber drivers, like not, shall we say, respecting somebody with disabilities needs. I don't know if that is just something that they don't know they have to. Yeah. Right. Or whatever else. Yeah, but certainly, like, they're not really in an environment where they are supported in doing so. Let's put it that way. Sure. Yeah, I don't know. I think they legally have to in some places, probably not everywhere, but, you know, it's yeah. not it's not good, right, either way. So I reckon also stuff like, oh, I should put this under time of day, comma, day of the week. All of this sort of stuff you can, you can put in there, and I'm sure that drivers will have other ideas. Oh, yeah, this baseline pay per kilometer per minute is something that you would basically work out from the distance and the offered pay. So you would put in here the distance, the distance to the pickup, the expected duration, time to pick up, and that sort of thing to get this in that model. In that baseline pay, I'm saying there probably is a rate. How you'd do that is you would work out this baseline rate based on the distance and the time estimated for the drives. There's probably a bunch of other stuff here, right? I've never been an Uber driver. I don't use the app as a customer either, so I don't know what sort of prices you see over time. You obviously have a little bit, but... So this is the sort of thing where if you were looking to do this as a research project, you would go and talk to Uber drivers and say, hey, what else do you reckon would go into this? Can you collect that data? Can you collect that data is kind of an interesting point here. Because if you know the time of day, so if you know when and where this happens, so you will also need location data, you can work out the weather and the temperature stuff. The driver supply, rider demand material is something that you need drivers to extract from the Uber app. Yeah. You may or may not not get complete data for that. Driver profile also changes over time. Like rating and these things are actual statistics that are calculated on their like driving habits. Yeah. So you would need to get information like let's say at the start of the day you get a driver to collect their rating and their acceptance and cancellation rates and things like that. That becomes the statistics get attached to all of the measurements over the course of that day. How much information you can get and its reliability, that's for you to basically work out as you're going. These are the sorts of things I would collect though. And you can think a lot further into this about what other things might Uber be trying to collect about the drivers in particular. Yeah. Because I can imagine that there's an awful lot of surveillance that the Uber app does that it may not tell drivers about. Yes. That, I reckon, would contribute to this in a big way. You just might not be able to see it from the outside. So whenever you build a model like this, because you don't know everything that goes in, you're not going to get a perfect fit. There's going to be error and things. And in particular, if Uber does like this stuff and playing around with what it offers to people, you're going to see error for that as well. Yeah. And what I'd say from experience of like people trying to do, uh, not wildcat, within the rules, but like work to rule stuff yeah. in workplaces is that you actually have to like keep talking to people and keep like- uh, yes. Keep affirming that action because it will fail if you just like hand around some sheets and expect people to do the (laughs) thing. Like it's uh Yeah, absolutely. Building solidarity takes a lot of work and it's hard. Yes, absolutely. I mean one of the um one of the research papers that I looked at that surveyed Uber drivers, they (laughs) their initial way of getting people to agree to sign up to the survey was to catch a ride and then talk to the driver about their research project, give them a five star rating and then invite them to be a survey participant, right? 
And of the 35 or so people they invited, two actually came along. Yeah. It's hard to do this sort of research. It's hard to do this sort of organizing because there's all kinds of conflicting interests here. Yeah. And ideology pays a huge part in it. For sure. So, like, uh, best of luck to you, I guess. And if this is useful, <laughs> I'm really glad for that. But of course, nothing against terms of service. I would never. Yeah. <laughs> a friend of my friend's ex-boyfriend. Mm. We got chatting late at night. We were both very depressed. And he'd come back from being in the... Uh, he'd been like a sailor, essentially, like working on like cargo ships kind of thing. Yeah. And was Uber driving while I was back in town because that's where his girlfriend was. Yeah, well, you do what you can, right? And then like ended up going back to sea because like it was so fucking grim. Like, doing that yeah. work. I think about him uh, all the time, and I really hope he's happy. Yeah. That was, like, a very grim situation all around. As one of you, or Dean, I hope he's all right, said, right, <laughs> this is something that only exists because of precarity. Yeah. And my hope is that as, as we see labor movements growing in the U.S. and other places, because, you know, people are seeing their lives get worse. Yeah. Right? Very rapidly. As that grows, I think we will see more act actions of solidarity among Uber drivers and other, like, rideshare drivers. I mean, arguably, even the act of being a driver on multiple apps is an act of resistance against this stuff. Because you can make a decision that, like, oh, Uber's paying like shit today, I'll be a Lyft driver for a while. Yeah. One of the things that was said is that a lot of people will, not necessarily in coordination, but as kind of individuals working towards their own interests, will see that Uber's paying like shit this week and will just autonomously decide to go and work for Lyft or whatever for a while. Yeah. To some extent, people are able to use those mechanisms of competition to their advantage. But imagine if everyone on Uber said, nah, fuck this for a week. Or even 10, 20% of people on Uber in yeah. a given city said that. Like, Uber would crash. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> or at the very least... And in a day or so in, they would be offering way more pay. <laughs> the best and most funny option would be if it ha if they were able to coordinate a proper labor action while there's also a, a public transport strike on. <laughs> yeah, well, that relies on there being public transport in the area, but for sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like U Uber drivers working with taxi drivers and things. I mean, there are people I've spoken to who do both, right? Who are yeah. Uber and taxi drivers because that's the only way they can make ends beat and they've For already sure. got the skill set, right? Yeah. I think that there is potentially fertile ground there, but the taxi companies are, of course, dead against it. Yeah. And have their own histories of awful exploitation, let's be very clear on that. My hope is that we see more action on this front. All right, but thank you so much for coming along. I'm always happy to be here. Yeah, Dean is alive, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, and to you, dear listener, thanks for listening and watching. We have a Patreon for five Australian dollars per month, I think is the lowest rate. Uh, you get an extra bonus episode and you get the slides. I'm no longer putting scripts up there because I now write them on physical paper instead of having them as typed notes because it turns out maths is hard to type just as, as like a text file, <laughs> and I couldn't be asked later, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. Thank you again, Bart, and I will see you next time. I look forward to it.